Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Zechariah, the book we're looking at this Lent in connection with the Gospels, is a fast-paced book, and it's full of spectacular visions and, and focuses really on God restoring his people. It's also one of the most quoted books in the New Testament, especially in the Passion narratives. Zechariah prophesied to the Jews who had returned to Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile. Now, God had previously allowed the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem, carry Jerusalem's inhabitants off into exile, and worst of all, destroy the temple. The temple was not only like a church, it was, but it was more than that, because in that actual building, God not only met with his people, but they were reconciled to him through the sacrificial system. Zechariah is written to inspire, well, he prophesied to inspire the building project of the second temple, because the first one had again been destroyed. Rebuilding the temple is therefore the occasion for Zechariah's prophecy. But he actually spends very little time talking about the building itself, and he spends way more time talking about how Yahweh will restore his people and gives them hope for the future. Uh, you can read about some of the circumstances and the history of this in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Sadly, what these returning Jews came back to was not the great city they had once known, but much more like a wild west or ruins or to a third world-like situation. There were roving gangs, basically, not really any police presence to speak of, and the city walls and gates were broken down, which was particularly a bad thing, considering there were roving gangs and no police force to speak of. After a fair amount of headaches and hard work, the walls and the gates were restored. But then the people lost momentum, they sputtered, and they stalled. Roughly two decades after returning to Jerusalem, there was still no progress on a rebuilt temple. They had lost their way and their gumption. But rebuilding the temple was the original reason that they had garnered the momentum and the monetary support to do what was practically unheard of in the ancient world, moving hundreds of miles away from civilization, civilization to a bunch of of ruins. But, Zechariah points out, this return was a chance for them to do a new thing, to learn from the sins of their forefathers and to make returning to Yahweh their number one priority. And that's why Zechariah kickstarts the idling Jews in Jerusalem, proclaiming, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts and I will return to you. Do not be like your fathers whom the former prophets cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded the servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? He, Zechariah, Yahweh through Zechariah is reminding them of what has just happened. Your fathers didn't listen to me, and it didn't work out very well for them. So take heed, take note, and repent. Now, the way that Zechariah says this to these Jews who had returned to Jerusalem is, it's almost, it would have certainly have caught their attention, it's almost a slap in the face because he says, return to me. Now, remember, these guys have done something that, is practically unparalleled in history. They've gone from something to nothing voluntarily. They've returned to Jerusalem, but Yahweh says, you've not really returned to me, not in your hearts, not in the most important way possible. After all, if they had really returned to him all the way, would they not have rebuilt the temple? The way that Yahweh had given them to be reconciled was through the temple and the sacrificial system. So Yahweh in the exile had removed his temple and, and his presence from among their fathers uh, since they weren't drawing near to him anyway, so why bother? But now it was a pretty simple. If the Jews wanted to reconnect with God, with Yahweh, at this point, they had to rebuild the temple. 
because that's the way that they could be reconciled. Well, the exile and the destruction of Jerusalem was good for something because upon hearing this warning, the, these folks did repent. And listen, they rolled up their sleeves and they got back to work on building this temple. And that's no small thing because not everyone who makes a mistake is willing to change their course of action. If, but if you didn't know, that's what Lent and Ash Wednesday are really all about. It's not really, or most importantly, about the ashes or what many of us miss, the Lenten meal. It's really about repentance. And so here we are repenting. Repentance is somewhat rare, but it's good. And we might say it's good, Lord, to be here to repent and to receive forgiveness for Christ's sake. Well, Zechariah remind, reminded the Jews that not everything that they had seen in the past was a good example. If we judge life by God's word and, and not simply with an infatuation of what's come before or an obsession with the new, we will undoubtedly find both good and bad in change as well as in constancy. How do you know, though, what should be repeated and what should be repented of? Our society is sort of undergoing upheaval and struggling with some of those very questions. How should the church respond? Should we throw the past out or should we fight any sort of change? Well, we can keep it simple. And practically anything the church does or responds to, the church should respond, which should start with repentance and move forward, trusting in our Lord and God. In other words, here's a way to look at it. History, it's a chance for us to repent. The future, it's a chance for us to have faith. Well, Zechariah was encouraging the people to honor God, in this case, by rebuilding a temple. Now, we are not in the middle of a capital campaign or a facility building project here, but we do have a people project. And maybe you don't think about it this way, but Grace Lutheran Church is growing and changing, whether it's through offering uh, oper a myriad of opportunities uh, among our own members or in the community or working with two different Ethiopian congregations. Um, lately, I've been doing some more reading and praying and really trying to act like the church is the body of Christ. We are certainly an institution, but we are also something more as God's people. And, and what a profound blessing to be able to walk together and help one another out as we grow as the body of Christ. Because our church is bigger than any one of the individual worship services or Bible studies that take place in our facility, uh, no matter what style of music or no matter whether the service is in English, Amharic, or Oromo. Uh, we're not just a bunch of people who happen to get along or even like all the same things but we are who Jesus has made us, which is why we all listen to his instructions. We repent and we place our trust in him. It's why we follow Jesus's example and have compassion and do our best to faithfully give testimony to the good news of salvation in Jesus. And sometimes, of course, we even fail at that and then we repent as well. But if we think of the church as constantly a building project, um, you can't really go forward with a building project until you have a level surface. And you, you, that you almost always have to start with something level. And that um, is exactly what John the Baptist is doing in humbling the high and mighty in Luke chapter 3 and lifting up the lowly, just as Jesus will continue to do in the book of Luke. Uh, Zechariah and the people of Jerusalem, when they got to Jerusalem, they had to clear away undoubtedly rubble and rocks, weeds and ashes of the old temple, which had been destroyed 70 years earlier. Well, we too, every Lent, every day, really, we have leveling to do in our own lives. And that's why Zechariah and John the Baptist and Jesus all call us to repent. You, we know that we may not always be able to change everything around us or the world, uh, but we can return to the Lord through a myriad of different ways, including daily devotions. Uh, we've got some Lenten devotions in the back if you need some. 
Or we can return to the Lord simply by checking in with him in the morning uh, or prayer uh, before going to bed. And that's also the heart of what Lent is about, about repentance and humility and also about focusing on Christ. To put God's plans first and to put our own plans second. It's tempting to leave God on the periphery and to give him some of our leftover attention. But absolutely any Christian, uh, no matter if it's their first day as a Christian or their last day on this world, can always aim to put Jesus first and to seek to filter the rest of our feelings and, and necessary tasks and struggles and joys through the cross and through the promises of Christ. And that's what Lent is about, refocusing upon Christ and remembering God's great love for us shown in the cross. So what we seek to do, knowing that we're imperfect, but nevertheless aiming for that goal to give God's instructions first priority in our lives, being willing to deny ourselves or our feelings or even our thoughts and to serve Christ first. We, as God's people, still have plenty of work to do, and God's Spirit is alive and well working on us as the body of Christ. He's building us up, continually building us up as the body of Christ, and He promises that He's going to continue to remake each of us individually as well, as well as all of creation, through Christ our Lord, to whom we look for lessons, help, and salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.